The race is on, and Lewis Hamilton claimed an unprecedented victory in the Brazilian Grand Prix at Interlagos, passing Max Verstappen along the way, having started the sprint race at the back following its qualifying exclusion, and then been hit with a five-place engine change penalty. I'm Ed Straw, and joining me to explain the dramatic racing on track and the wing-based acrimony off it are Scott Mitchell and Mark Hughes. Well, Mark, how are you getting on? Are you enjoying the inaugural Sao Paulo Grand Prix in this, this brand new circuit? Yeah, it's um, it's got a strangely familiar feel to it, hasn't it? Um, it's, it's like one of the great Brazilian tracks um, where, where we've, we've seen the so many title deciders over the years. It, it's got, it sort of feels like that. <laughs> Enough of that conceit, yes. Uh, I think we're going to see this a little bit more. Mexico City's already got a Grand Prix, hasn't it? But we're going to call it the Brazilian Grand Prix because that's very much what it is. I think there was a Sao Paulo Grand Prix back in the dim and distant past, wasn't there? That was sort of a, a not a super high status race, but it's, it's, it is an old name rather than a completely made up one. I'll, I'll give them that. I'm also joined by Scott Mitchell, who is sharing the very same sofa as me. Unusual proximity for this podcast. Uh, well... We we sat near each other for the for the Mexico podcast. It just we weren't. It wasn't in sofa form, I suppose. We were just. It was. Uh, you were perched on the edge of your bed, and I was on a a stool kind of thing. So uh, I think we're um, we're not too we're not too close. We've been. This is about as close as as we we, we normally are. I feel we've gone up in the world having a sofa. This this should guarantee some top quality podcasting and if that's not a guarantee of top quality podcasting well the race was so dramatic I don't think we can fail to make this uh, a massively interesting one so Mark let's get into it we'll get into the controversy and all that shortly but we've got to start with a majestic performance from Lewis Hamilton haven't we surely one of his best victories given he did have to come back from starting at the back of the sprint race to finish fifth and then from 10th on the Grand Prix grid after a five place penalty to pass Max Verstappen and win yeah, we've seen it so often from him in the past that he does his best stuff when all the odds are against him, haven't we? And it's um, <laughs> still at, um, thinking of the uh, the tattoo he has on, on his back saying, still I rise. And he, he, he lives up to that, doesn't he? He, he? he frequently lives up to that and, and just sort of manages to overcome obstacles that are put in his way in a very impressive way. And yeah, he had a, a very fast car this weekend. But he still he started the weekend in twentieth last, you no, know, and he he did that it to, to win that uh, entailed overtaking what was it twenty twenty four cars or something like that. So yeah, I mean it was a sensational performance and um, a, a thrilling one and played out in very dramatic, typically Hamilton style. Yeah, absolutely. And, and Max Verstappen played his part as well with the championship at stake. The two title contenders yet again going toe-to-toe, which is just uh, just brilliant. But I think the quality of the drive is easy to underestimate by those who just focus on the quality of the car. Even in the sprint race, Scott, where you could say Lewis Hamilton did the heavy lifting of getting himself into a reasonable place for the, for the, the Grand Prix. Yeah, they were DRS passes, but there was more to it than that, wasn't there? Yeah, it was all about how... Uh how Hamilton was setting himself up mainly through the the middle sector, obviously, to stay close enough to be within DRS range and get the toe, but not be so close that you just lost all grip in the dirty air through the middle sector and and fell back and worse, killed your tyres as well. So that was one element of it. But the other element was that some of the passes had to be really nicely judged. It It wasn't a case that every single one of them was him driving up to the back of someone off of the final corner down the straight, blast pass into turn one um ricardo covered the inside at one point forcing lewis to to jink to the right to make sure that he he got past lando norris didn't make it easy into turn one but the one that i really liked which i thought just even though it was the only one of lewis's i think 14 overtakes in that race because i think Kimi raikkonen spun so that's sort of that was the one that was the only one he was gifted um even though the pass on Charles Leclerc was the only one that wasn't done on the start finish straight or into turn one, it was done down to turn four. It just it summed up the intelligence of the drive because every time he was behind someone, you could see him doing slightly different things based on where he sort of thought he was quicker than the car in front. Sometimes he was also not quite hugging the car tight to the apex just to save a little bit of the 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 front tires sometimes he was taking wider lines through so that he was able to get a good run off the corner and beh- when he was behind Leclerc he got the message that he was particularly strong in turns two and three compared to Leclerc so it was really interesting you see Lewis checked up a little bit more through turn one so that he had a better 
angle of attack through two. And then he really lent on the outside tyre through two. Got on the throttle very early, nice and aggressive. Got a blistering run through two and three. And that's what allowed him to then get in the toe, use the DRS, pull out on Leclerc and get him on the brakes into turn four. That wasn't just a drive-by pass into turn four. So yeah, that was the, I think that was the best overtaking. It just, it just encapsulated a lot of what made that drive really good. Yeah, and so many times we see quick cars at the back and they do make reasonable progress. But once they're in among the quicker cars, it's very easy to get stuck in DRS trains. Yes, Interlagos is one of those circuits where overtaking is, is easier than some others. Yes, it was a sprint format, which helped him because he had those two bites of the cherry, the kind of reset. But even so, you just don't see people doing this. This is the first time someone's been at the back in qualifying and come through to win the Grand Prix. Okay, unusual format, but even so... That's a high quality driver in anyone's book. But no, looking at the race itself, we'll get into the the on track battles between them specifically. But in terms of the way it played out strategically, obviously, I think it was around about lap eighteen. Hamilton got up into second place. Obviously, Bottas left him led him past. Then he got past Perez, and then there was a little interesting strategic battle, wasn't there? With first Hamilton taking the undercut, and then for the second stop, Verstappen anticipating it, and then it all came down to that last thing. So, how did the strategy play out? It was, as ever, um, more or less driven by tyre usage. And the this weekend, it was the Red Bull that was struggling more with the the tyres, and it was the the front tyres in particular. And so, yeah, the, Max had a track position, and then obviously um, Mercedes wanted to put as much pressure on them as possible to to bring Max in early. So um, that's that's. The, 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 as soon as um, Lewis had cleared, I think it was Ricardo's McLaren, they brought him in and um, Red Bull had to respond the following lap. And then in that middle middle stint, there were sort of a, a couple of seconds, what, what, between 1.2 and 2 seconds apart for the pretty much the whole of that middle stint. And they, they were re- really just sort of um, driving to their tyre temperatures at that in that stage of the race. And um max was almost paranoid i think he 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 understood by this time that it was um possible that uh mercedes were going to jump them and with with the undercut again and he was almost paranoid about about not allowing that to happen and he was he was kept pushing the team to say you know let, let's make sure we don't get undercut let's make sure we don't get undercut and they brought him in as early as they possibly could, really, um, lap 40 for the second stop. And really, that was a little bit too early. It left, given that the, the, the Red Bull was using its front tyres very hard, that left that left them with too much to do, too, too long a final stint. And, you know, as he began that stint, he said to them, how do you want me to handle this? And they said, well, you have to look after your tyres. And at that, that was when Lewis went on the attack. And um, he just kept... Just kept the pressure on the whole time. Um, had that sort of, uh, uh, I guess you'd call it a, a dummy pass on lap 48 when um, Max ran them both off the circuit. Um, but then he just regrouped from there and put the pressure straight back on again and kept it up. And eventually, yeah, Max just didn't have the, the front tyres left to, um, to defend anymore. And uh, yeah, it was quite straightforward from then. Yeah, it was one of those things, wasn't it? As soon as Hamilton got up there and was in second, and it was only, I think he was still within four seconds of Max by the time he got up to second place, it always felt like it was going to go that way because the pace of the car was was tremendous. But just a little bit of a question mark. I guess you can understand why Verstappen wanted to make absolutely sure that it could be decided on track rather than through strategy because the only chance really he had was making life difficult for, for Hamilton. Of course, Scott, there was that first attempt to pass, turn four, Controversial. Hamilton and Soto Wolf weren't too happy about it. Obviously, Hamilton went around the outside of turn four. Both had to take to the runoff. Verstappen, of course, was on the inside. The stewards said no investigation necessary. So can you explain what went on there first? Um, well, essentially, they I I think they were just looking for an excuse to be able to take no action because it's just easier to do nothing in, in, in that scenario. Um, the what it came down to is that it is the let them race principle, which had sort of quietly died away for a little while and didn't seem to really be being enforced very much. And now it's back. Apparently, um, that's that was at the heart of the decision. Um, it was kind of 
kind of difficult to get a really clear answer from from the FIA. Um, <clears throat> but a, a, a key part of it was the fact that the stewards um, the stewards didn't have Max's uh, forward facing onboard camera, which kind of crucial to make a, a judgment call in that in that scenario. You need to see what Max's steering inputs. Uh, are, are like was he having to correct anything mid corner or anything like that? So all the stewards had to go off was uh, the the live images that are being broadcast at the time, and that's not just what appears on the world feed. That's what's being broadcast from the cars. So the whatever the onboard camera is fixed on, um, or with whichever onboard camera is, is fixed on. So from Hamilton's point of view, it was the it was a forward facing camera, but for Max, it was a rearward facing camera. So that was obviously no use to to check to see what Max had done. So they only they had a quick look at it because the incident was noted but not investigated. So that means you just take a brief look at what's available in terms of live images, but you don't go into things like radio telemetry, that kind of stuff. So they they weren't making the decision blind, but they were making it about some pretty crucial data, which was Max's steering traces and and Max's onboard uh, or forward facing onboard. So honestly, I'm I'm when I found when when I found that out, I. I was even more surprised that it didn't merit a full investigation because you can't make a, an informed decision there without without all the info. And um, from, a, from a simple point of view, the cars went in side by side. Hamilton was going to make the corner, but until Verstappen took too much speed in, ran wide and took Hamilton o- o- onto the runoff with him. So I don't see how that can't satisfy the definition of uh, forcing another driver off the track. And... But my my issue with it is that I don't I don't have a problem with hard racing, and I have generally subscribed to the view that on the outside you're taking a risk trying to pass on the outside. So if you get run out wide, that's just hard racing, and it's how it is. But I changed my view earlier this year from Austria onwards because that was what we were told by the FIA w- was the way to go racing. Now you you can't force a you can't run another driver out of road on the exit of the corner. You have to leave a car's width. And we saw we've seen penalties for drivers for forcing a car off the road. So, you know, I was like, okay, well, I, I appreciate that maybe my way of viewing racing is maybe a little bit out of date. So maybe I need to move with the times, update. This is how the FAA wants F1 to go racing. I've adjusted to that. We've come here, and it just seems we're operating to a slightly different interpretation of the rule again. So, I think it was quite, quite confusing, and it wouldn't. Su- it wouldn't surprise me if a lot of people were listening to this and just thinking, well, that doesn't really explain why Verstappen got away with it. But that's because there, there isn't really a, a very clear explanation. They just they just said, oh, we're just going to apply the let them race rule for this one. Yeah, it seemed to be a combination less of let them race and it was more no harm, no foul combined with it would be better if this decided on track, which I can kind of understand. But yeah, if you look at the way the rules are written, it's a bit questionable. But as always, members of the Race Members Club have sent in questions. And Mark, Oscar Robledo said, did Max's defence against Lewis cross the line when they both went off at turn four? And should he have received a penalty? Um, according to the uh, the way that the, as Scott has just been saying, according to the way that the FIA has um, indicated it, it wishes racing to be conducted, yes, he did. Um, according to the traditional etiquette of racing as established over you know decades and decades of racing no he didn't it was just hard racing and um i've uh you know lewis was marginally ahead and on the outside and he could have um perfectly legitimately said no i'm staying here when max ran out wide in which case it would have been a collision um and they would have you know both been entitled to have uh make this made the decisions that they did and uh, would have had to live with the consequences. Um, for me, it was a similar situation to uh, cops at Silverstone, albeit at a much lower speed and, you know, without as, as much uh, peril. But the, the the places of the the two cars are quite similar. You've got um, one guy marginally ahead but on the outside, the other guy on the inside unwilling to give up the place. So something has to give, and in this case, it was Lewis deciding, "No, I'll back out of this. I don't need to do. You know, I've, I've, I'm sure I can. Um, I'm sure I can pass him without uh, doing it in such a marginal way." And uh, that's just how it played out. And I, yeah, and I think that was pretty. It was hard, and it was on the edge. Um, but given that it was for a, a title contest, 
I, I think that was fair enough. It was just hard and hard edged. And I think probably the stewards would rather not have got involved given that it's a title contest. I think it was just enough leeway for them to give themselves that space to say, let's not get involved because it wasn't, wasn't quite a foul by anyone. Yeah. I, I think all I'd add is that um, one of the things that made it a bit more clear cut in the context of the rules that have seemed to have been, seemed to have been laid out for this year earlier, earlier in the season was that, um, you know, if, if Max had, if Max had kept his car on the track and just sort of, you know, shoved Lewis over the curb or something like that, then the, my my old my older sort of way of uh, of viewing it, I'd have said, well, it's just hard racing. I, I I don't have a problem with that. But the fact that Max sailed off onto the runoff, sort of, it just it just felt like it was going to be a slam dunk based on some of the marginal calls that they've made this year and 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 turned into forcing another car off the track. But I guess. I guess the only thing you can say is that in football, at least, um, for example, there there is a uh, one unified set of laws, but obviously every referee is different, aren't they? Some some are more lenient than others, so may, maybe maybe that's a factor as well. It's it's hard to say, but um, I think uh, I think the main thing is that we ended up with on the balance of the race the right outcome because obviously ultimately it wasn't this stewards controversy that decided the outcome of of the race, which was quite a relief in the end because it would have sucked to have sat here discussing whether or not. Max should have been given a five-second penalty and lost and lost the win because that that is never a desirable outcome. Yeah, that would have been a rather tedious way for it to work out. But it, it as we've said, it comes down to the slight erraticness of the way the FIA applies these things. I think collectively, anyone who listens to this podcast will know. I think all three of us tend towards the light touch with penalties and only in extreme circumstances. But they they kind of tie themselves in knots a bit on it. I should add in the post-race press conference, you made the Silverstone uh, comparison a minute ago. Mark, but our, our colleague Andrew Benson, who works for the, the BBC, did ask uh, Max about the similarities to the Silverstone incident, which uh, Max wasn't having. He said, I don't think it's the same, so I don't know what he's referring to. Completely different corner. There's not much more to comment. It's not the same. So he was uh, batting that one away. But yeah, it's a bit of a mess the way the, the penalties are being applied. And I think it's more a, an FIA problem than a Verstappen problem in this case. But yeah, by the, the letter of the crowding regulations. There was a there was a potential problem there, and I think as Carlos Sainz said, you could solve it just by putting a gravel trap there. If there's a gravel trap, it wouldn't happen, would it? So, completely changes things. So once again, we get into the old chestnut about track runoff, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But as it was, it didn't make a huge difference. It was just another moment in this this wonderful battle between the two. Max's rear guard in a in a slower car at that point, well, throughout the whole weekend, in fact versus the the charging Hamilton. So just another talking point in this great season. But let's move on to the off-track stuff, Mark, the technical controversy of the weekend. Hamilton was slung out of qualifying for what Mercedes said was being 0.2 millimetres over the 85 millimetre limit for the gap between the upper and lower rear wing elements when the DRS is activated. I think Andrew Shovlin said it was basically a coat of paints worth that, uh, that amount. So can you explain how this all played out? Yeah, well, there was um, an apparently random test done of the wings after qualifying for the sprint. Um, but the backdrop to that is um, Red Bull has been getting very animated about why the Mercedes is so fast down the straight. And even even though it's a low drag car and would be expected to be a, a low rate car and would be expected to be lower drag, therefore, and therefore faster down the straight, they feel it's too much faster down the straight for that to be the only reason. And they've got a few theories on on as to what what they think they're doing, and so um, they've been campaigning behind the the scenes for the FIA to look at it. And it probably wasn't a coincidence that they randomly picked a Mercedes. And in looking for any discrepancy in the wing, they they sort of stumbled by accident almost on this um, what seems to have been a what what even the stewards say looks to have been a a, a broken. A broken part, which has led for the last ten percent of the outboard of the the gap to be 0.2 of a millimeter bigger than it um, is allowed to be, and um, so yeah, this this was reported by the FIA technical delegate to the stewards, and they really really didn't have very much option once it's once it's um, in front of them to to do anything but. Um, penalise them, which is a uh, disqualification from that, the qualifying session. So, yeah, um, the, the the fact that he was absolutely blindingly fast with the replacement wing 
um, in, in the sprint race itself suggests that it, that wasn't the reason for his, his speed in qualifying. Um, and if you're talking about the gap is 80, should, should be 85 millimeters maximum. And if a part of it is 0.2 of a millimeter beyond 85 millimeter, the, the chances of that having anything that could be measured even at the thousandth of a second in lap time is, is negligible. So it, it wasn't any that wasn't anything to do with why the Mercedes was so fast. It was a, it almost muddied the waters as to why the Mercedes was fast. And so yes, um, the 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 mystery of um, well, you know Red Bull's um, contention about what they think Mercedes is doing to be able to go so fast down the straight uh, continues. Yeah, and it should be noted that if this 0.2 millimeter was anything to do with any supposed trickery. The, the clincher on it is you wouldn't do it asymmetrically. You wouldn't do it on one side, but not the other of the wing, which is effectively would have been the case. So that kind of shows that this was down to a fault. And in fact, that answers partly a question from Trisha Harding, who says, well, Hamilton's rear wing changed from being illegal for the sprint race, or did he still have the advantage? Well, yes, he still had his advantage, but not from the thing that was found to be illegal being changed. The, the spec was the same. It's just it was a rear wing that does not have a fault. And Mercedes stressed that that when that wing's been tested in the past, it's passed that test, which is kind of a, a sort of probe gauge is, is pushed to, pushed into the wing. And if it's uh, if it's able to um, to get through because the gap's uh, too big, then uh, then it's deemed to be illegal. So yeah, one of those <laughs> uh, a, a controversial ones. But connected to that, Simon T asked, do we know what Red Bull think Mercedes are doing to gain extra speed? Do Mercedes have a clever weir ring contraption? What do we know about that? Um, we don't know anything for sure, but um, we saw Max Verstappen sort of feeling the underside of his own wing and then going across to Lewis Hamilton's car and feeling the underside of that wing, um, sort of suggesting that they feel that the underside may be flexing. And now, when flexy wings were, um, you know, early, earlier this season, when when um, after Mercedes campaigned about Red Bull's flexy wings, of course, we had the technical directives came in, which um, stipulated that um, markings would be put on the bodywork of the car at the back, and there'd be a rearward facing camera to record any, you know, any discrepancy. So um, you couldn't now do it in the way it was being done then. It would be captured on the camera, and you'd be banged to right. So um, another way of doing it might be to make the underside of the wings, so that's out of sight of the camera, um, flexible. So um, perhaps they were checking there. And of course, because this was all going on, Scott, there's a huge amount of acrimony and backbiting and Toto Wolff and Christian Horner and others going at each other. <laughs> Must admit, it got a little bit it got a little bit tedious at times. But what exactly was going on there? Why is there so much needle? Well, I think there's just this there's been this tense backdrop for months and months and months now. So much suspicion on either side, a dash of paranoia as well, I'm sure, creeping in. And I'm sure that both sides have seen a few ghosts along the way, where 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 the you know problems that just aren't there. But on this occasion, basically, Toto Wolff just thought that there was a bit of double standards going on um, because the example he gave was was that it's common practice if a if a fault is observed during a session under park Fermi conditions, then you can do a you can do you can expect to request and receive permission to to make the change and the Mercedes argument was that Red Bull were allowed to fix faults in their rear wing at, in in previous qualifying sessions for example in park Fermi conditions faults that I I assume Toto's implying would have then made the or could have then made the the the, the car illegal um because his point is that Mercedes were never afforded that opportunity because this fault was, or the likely fault that caused this, them to fail this test was only discovered after after qualifying finished. And the FIA stewards um, opted not to consider that mitigating circumstances and said that that, w- that shouldn't apply in this case because basically there was no obvious evidence that it was anything other than the normal running conditions of the session that had had an impact, which uh, on the face of it didn't really make sense. But I, I don't, I don't think the Mex- the like the Mexico qualifying comparison for Red Bull quite holds up because the the point here is is ultimately that fault or not it it did lead to Mercedes rear wing not passing a test whereas when Red Bull was asked for permission to change its parts in the past I I assume they've always been within 
you know, technical regularity. That they've always been within conformity of the rules. So I think, I think that's the key difference between the two. I, I, I can understand where Mercedes are coming from in in, in principle, absolutely. And I do have sympathy because ultimately, it, it seems that it just comes down to a bit of like pure luck. Like if you have this problem in Q1 or Q2 and you notice it, you've got chance to rectify it before the car has to go out again, perhaps. Um, but if it happens in Q3 and then you're found out afterwards and it makes you fail a test, then that's you're, that's that's it. You're just thrown out of the session. That that appears to be the precedent here. And you know, I, I know I know that there's there are lots of elements of of any sport that do that does come down to just just bad luck and timing. And sometimes it's on your side and sometimes it isn't. But that that's where I do have some sympathy. It does seem a bit. It's, it seems a bit to be a bit of a stretch that if, if it happens in Q1 or Q2, you're fine. But if it happens in Q3, that's it. You're disqualified from the entire session. So, yeah, I, I think that's just a bit... Um, it's just a bit unlucky. Yeah, it's one of those things that generally gets dealt with without it coming to an exclusion, isn't it? But as soon as it goes to the stewards, as you said, Mark, because it is a black and white technical line, then even for something minor like that, the stewards' hands end up being tied to prevent it happening. Then you need it not to go to the stewards. But in a way, it was a good thing, wasn't it? Because it set the stage for this uh, this pretty famous drive, one of the uh, uh, certainly one of the best that Hamilton has uh, has ever produced. We should also briefly mention Mark the Verstappen fine. He was fined fifty thousand euros for prodding around on the uh, the rear wing of Hamilton. Obviously, he felt his, and then and then Hamilton's rear wing in part firm after. The qualifying session, obviously a fan video captured that. What did you make of what went on there? Yeah, well, that was just um, Max testing out um, the, the the theory about wh- how how Mercedes might be doing it. Um, so we're checking to see if they were had um, a, a mushy underside on the wing, which um, might uh, deform at uh, higher speeds, perhaps. So we, I think he was just sort of comparing how his wing felt with how theirs felt on the underside. Yeah, and it slightly muddied the waters again with this very lengthy stewarding decision because obviously people started to wonder whether he, could they argue he'd interfered with it or whatever. So yeah, it, it was a little bit of a red herring in that regard. But I think the principle of not interfering with, you're not meant to touch your car, you're certainly not meant to touch other people's cars. And it should be noted, the stewards did say that the €50,000 Euro fine isn't necessarily a precedent for, for future uh, breaches of this, which means it could go either way. If somebody decides they want to pay fifty thousand euros to get a good close up look at something, they shouldn't be. Then that means they can't do that. But it was absolutely right. It wasn't a sporting penalty. And before we move uh, off off Verstappen, obviously we should say Scott. While this was Hamilton's weekend, Verstappen has made the best of it in many ways, hasn't he? He's beaten Bottas. Could have been behind Bottas. So. While not a great weekend that he'll look back on with with delight, it's still pretty good for his championship aspirations, isn't it? Yeah, and also don't forget if you normally normally if you finish second to someone in in a race, you lose seven points. But he's only lost five points to Lewis this, this weekend because he grabbed a couple in the in the sprint, finishing second. So it's actually it's not bad going, is it? He only shipped five points to to, to Lewis. I think the leads down to is it fourteen points now? It was nineteen before the weekend? So. Um, I, I, I think Max has to look at that as, yeah, maybe pre-weekend. I know Merck were talking up to how strong Rebel were going to be and higher temperatures on Sunday. Maybe Max um, w- was being played up as the favourite, obviously led early on, all of this, blah, blah, blah. But all that did was set the ground for, groundwork for him to uh, to beat one of the Mercedes on a weekend where the Mercedes was clearly faster. So I just think, yeah, good job all round. These are, um, it's a continuation of Verstappen's incredible run where, out in normal circumstances he hasn't finished lower than lower than second this season so um it is super impressive yeah he was a bit dicey a couple of times he picked up a one of the rare black and white warning flags for weaving uh when lewis was was chasing him but max was um was otherwise pretty good and ultimately when lewis did get past him he he behaved sensibly it could have so easily turned into a repeat of charles leclerc versus sebastian vettel in 2019 where they collide needlessly on the run down to four but Ultimately, Verstappen behaved himself on that occasion, slotted in behind, didn't do anything silly and, and banked the points. Still a 14-point World Championship lead for him, which is a, a healthy margin to have with uh, just the three races left this season. Before we move off this, Mark, a couple of questions from the Race Members Club related to Mercedes engines. James Pascalis asked, do you think it's possible that Mercedes are running that new ICE in a much higher mode, given it only has to do four races? 
while Ollie Wright says, even with a new engine, Lewis seems to have had a remarkable bit of extra pace. Where did it come from and will it stay with him in the Middle East races? So what do we know about the performance of the engine in that situation? Yeah, there's two things there. There's the the extra performance that you're getting from a fresh engine, and it's very clear that the Mercedes uh, degrades more over its mileage life than the Honda. And Christian Horner was saying at the, the weekend that um, from beginning of the life of the Honda to the end of, the, of its mileage, it loses about a tenth of a second, that's all. The Mercedes loses more than that, and, and that's just, you know, even without the problems it's been carrying. So... When you put a fresh Mercedes engine in, you do get a bigger boost than the, the one you've just taken out, but that's because the one you've taken out is degraded more than the equivalent Honda one. Um, but the other thing is, um, they they've been carrying a they've been carrying a problem with their engines for the whole second half of the year, really, and have been running them very very conservatively. And until they put this new one in uh, this weekend. The one the the one that went in in Turkey, which is PU five power unit five, um, no power unit four, sorry, um, that was going to have to do seven races, which is you know it's pushing things a bit, especially with a a, a unit that you know is um is has got a weak spot, so it's uh, it they introduced this one to give them an, an extra engine in the pool. And yes, to come back to the first question, that will almost certainly have um, made them more confident to run a higher mode than they otherwise would have done um, because you, you, you're you spreading the mileage out between two power units rather than one. Well, we'll return to the Brazilian Grand Prix in a moment as there's plenty more to talk about. But first, this podcast is sponsored by the Saudi Arabian Grand Prix at the new Jeddah Corniche Circuit. So we're going to take a quick look ahead to the race and in particular, the new track. Normally, when you think of street circuits, you think slow and twisty, but amazingly, this is set to be the second fastest on the calendar with an average speed of not far off 160 miles per hour, or to put it another way, just over 250 kilometers an hour. So Mark, what do you make of the challenge that awaits F1 drivers there? Yeah, it looks quite distinctive. It looks um, it's, it's, the opening section. It looks quite similar to the start of the Abu Dhabi lap, but then it moves into this very fast section, and the sensation of speed's sort of exaggerated by the, the the wall of fences and street lights to the side. But that this particular section is a lot of very interconnected, fast sweeps, sort of left, right, one fitting into the other. But it doesn't. They don't look like flat out kinks. It looks like you'd really have to be wrestling the car through them. It, pretty high speed and that you'd need to get every part of it right it's it's one of those sequences where if you you mess up the first bit you've messed up the whole thing so that looks to be a big challenge and and the the walls of course are waiting there to bite you if you get it wrong so i think that first section will quickly sort out the men from the boys i expect everybody be on top of it by the end of the first session but yeah it's 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 a it's very very fast it doesn't look like a street circuit it just feels like a very fast sort of stadium track very different to anything else on the calendar so we know it's going to be a great driving challenge, Scott. How about overtaking? Yeah, I think there's um there's reasonable um there's reasonable potential. Um it's one of the it's been the track's been designed with um a sort of what you might describe as a new generation of F1 track uh, in mind. This idea of focusing more on sequences of corners that allow cars to follow a bit more closely and then having a braking zone towards the end of that sequence of corners that uh, that really allow um <sighs> A re- allow a lap to come together uh, uh, effectively and it's also one of the reasons why there's been such a big focus on 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 keep making this a high speed uh street track and obviously the the, the talk of three drs zones for example it play, plays into that it's our idea being that the more flat out you're running the easier it is to follow the car in front and then you can get a good run a good toe i really like what they've uh what they've laid out for the final corner wide on the entry titans um, so it's slow enough to, to get the job done. It's ca- it's a bit cambered as well. So it's one of those tracks that I think has been a bit more considered than some of the tracks we've seen in the past. Perfectly set up for a last corner of the race pass. That's what it sounds like. So we've got a super fast, first of its kind circuit to look forward to for the inaugural Saudi Arabia Grand Prix running from the 3rd to the 5th of December. And there's plenty happening off track as well with the musical entertainment on all three days of the event. Brilliant lineup there, including ASAP Rocky, Justin Bieber, Jason Derulo, David Guetta, and many more star names. But for now, let's get back to Interlagos. Well, Scott, 
We don't need to visit Valtteri Bottas' sympathy corner today because he did have a slice of luck in the race with the timing of the VSC, allowing him to pit and re-emerge ahead of Perez to secure third place. He wasn't at Hamilton's level this weekend, but he did at least take another sprint race win and pick up a podium. Yeah, he did. Um, he did a good job uh, on on Saturday. He he got the jump on um, he got the jump on Verstappen and used the soft tire as well, and then held on as the tyres were just starting to cry enough towards the end. So he did what he needed to do there. He took a point off of uh, Verstappen. And then it, uh, <laughs> as it off, so often does for Valtteri, it basically doesn't matter whether it's one lap qualifying or sprint qualifying. Valtteri Bottas is absolutely brilliant on Saturdays and then it just sort of falls away from him a little bit on Sunday. So he obviously, he lost ground early on. Um, he then made a mistake at uh, turn four. So he dropped behind both Red Bulls and... Um, it was a little bit messy, but in the end, he did well and made the most of that uh, VSC to get back ahead of um, get back ahead of Perez. Uh, and he's he's doing his job in the constructors' championship by being the the best of the number twos on on balance. Um, so yeah, I think this was a a pretty solid weekend's work at the very least for, for for Bottas. Good, not great, but that's what we've come to expect from him. Yeah, an eleven points advantage for Mercedes in the Constructors' Championship. So after a couple of races with Red Bull whittling away at it, that's uh, that's the gap we've got for the, those last three races. But a bit unlucky for, for Perez because he could have had a fourth consecutive third place finish there, which again would have been him ticking all the boxes. But another good qualifying performance from him, just a tenth and a bit behind Verstappen. So that's three consecutive proper qualifying performances from him, you would say, Mark. I think he's been within... He's certainly been within that magic three tenths in all three of those. I think it's been within two and a half tenths in all three. Yeah, Perez has really made a breakthrough. Um, sort of Austin that really um, seemed to come together. There have been signs leading up to Austin, but from there onwards, he's really seemed to have, um, yeah, just just sort of cracked the code, as it were. Um, partly, you know, they, they've come back a little bit on how extreme the traits were in the car, and partly he's sort of been allowed to go his own way a little bit more on on how he sets the car up and it's yeah it's just found a sort of happy happier space than he was in yeah and he's back to doing the job I think we all expected him to do this season just take him a little bit longer than perhaps we expected for him to get there let's move on to Ferrari Mark the only other team to finish on the lead lap with the Mercedes and the Red Bull drivers with Charles Leclerc fifth and Carlos Sainz sixth a straightforward Grand Prix for them after Leclerc passed Sainz on the opening lap is that a near killer blow in that battle for third place in the constructors' championship? Given McLaren is now thirty one point five points behind after a couple of pretty low scores. Yeah, I think so. Um, three races left. It's it's a big gap for McLaren to to bridge. Um, the, the, the McLaren can just suddenly turn up one weekend and be really quick. You, you, you'd say that their their peaks um, are probably going to be a bit higher than Ferrari's. Or they can be, um, but I think since that power unit upgrade of Ferraris, they're, they're contenders for strong points every weekend. It, it's not um, it's not to hit and miss anymore. And uh, yeah, given given the lead that they have now, it, well, that's all they need to do for the remaining three races to pretty much guarantee that place. And of course, Scott, McLaren did just have one point courtesy of Lando Norris's recovery drive to 10th from last after a first lap puncture. Daniel Ricciardo, of course, retired from 8th with a power unit problem while potentially on course to make a one-stopper work. He was ahead of the Alpine drivers at the time. That puncture for Norris was caused by contact with Sainz on the run to the first corner. Anyone have anything to apologise for for that? Um, well, I think Sainz did, but sort of felt like it was just because he owed Lando an apology because they're mates rather than actually thinking he'd done anything wrong. Um I don't know. I, Carlos said he um, he felt he was he was squeezed so that he d- he didn't really have um, much choice. I, it was difficult to judge from the brief replay that I saw when when it happened. I think it was just Lando being unlucky rather than anyone else doing anything. Like he, nobody did him dirty. It was just a bit unfortunate. We've seen that kind of crowding before. Um, but yeah, it was just uh, typical of um, this little mini run that McLaren find themselves in. They were. They don't. They don't believe that the competitive order has actually changed that much from the first half of the season. Obviously, Ferrari's made a step with the upgraded hybrid system, but McLaren thinks otherwise. It's the same. They're they're quicker than the other teams in the midfield. When Alpha Tauri get it right, they can be quicker than McLaren and Ferrari or in the mix. And Ferrari were already there and have now had a bonus from the power unit. And then 
McLaren's not been upgraded since what just after the summer break, I think at the um, at, at least. So um, I think they're just having some slightly messy races after over overachieving a few times earlier in the year, and unfortunately, it's meant that they've relinquished their grip on third in the championship. Yeah, and a small side note for the the Ferrari battle. Obviously, Science was third in the sprint race. He made the most of the softs and gained a few places at the start, but Leclerc got ahead on the, on the first lap there. Science, funnily enough, after the sprint race, was was pretty pleased. Spoke, spoke to him after the race. He was talking about how good his starts are, how much work he's been doing on them, and that that was the first kind of really good one. And he was a bit disappointed because he picked up, I think, some wheel spin this time, which led to him being but behind Leclerc. But I did ask him about it a bit later on, and he said they'd been over the data, and he did everything he was meant to do at the start. But he said he couldn't say exactly what it was, but he said there was some kind of fault with the clutch, a minor thing that wasn't quite as it should have been. So I think the word he used was relieved that it wasn't him regressing after all that work he's done. So let's keep an eye on his starts uh, for future races. But Pierre Gasly was seventh. He was the lead driver on the of the lapped down group, should we say, Scott. He came through to to get back ahead of Esteban Ocon and Fernando Alonso, who were one stop in Gasly, two stopped. Gasly did have to work hard to get past him, and he did say they were playing games while trying to hold him off. What did you make of that? Uh, situation fair play for for two teammates to try and create a bit of a of a wall for another driver to get past yeah absolutely especially when it's uh, against your direct rival in the championship Alpine and AlphaTauri fighting over fifth so um I don't think there was any 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 issue we've seen it plenty of times where one car hangs back and you you can benefit from the toe or DRS or or or, or whatever it is um especially as we know that the the Honda power unit is slightly stronger than the Renaults, which hasn't been updated for for for, for this season. So, um, yeah, you you throw everything you can in that situation, especially when you have ultimately got a a slightly slower car. So you have to start to get a bit um, clever. But that's the advantage you have when you have both your cars in the mix and not one of them, which is obviously what uh, AlphaTauri had. Pierre Gasly was fighting this race solo. Yeah, both the Alpine drivers were pretty happy after the race, even though they weren't able to keep. Gasly at bay for more than three or four laps didn't really go anywhere, but they were they were thrilled with their with their uh, their team tactics. And Alonso, of course, was uh, let past and then had to let uh, Ocon back past on the, on the last lap. Said he didn't mind because it didn't make any difference to the uh, overall positions. And ended up with AlphaTauri and Alpine, who are level pegging for fifth in the constructors' championship, both taking away six points. So hopefully that battle is going to go down to the wire as well. Mark, Sebastian Vettel was 11th and a little unfortunate with the timing of the VSC in his battle with Ocon in particular, but that's better than teammate Lance Stroll managed for Aston Martin. Having passed Yuki Tsunoda at the start of the last lap of the sprint, uh, the AlphaTauri driver then dived up the inside of Stroll at turn one early in the Grand Prix, mashed his front wing on the side of Stroll's car. That earned him a 10-second penalty that Tsunoda branded absolutely ridiculous. Uh, Stroll, meanwhile, described the move as desperate. So who is right? Uh, Stroll. <laughs> it was it was uh, it was a move that I can understand uh, what Yuki's thinking of. He's the only guy out there on the soft tires, and you know he's he's got stuck behind Lance, and he can he feels he can probably go a lot quicker because he's on the softer tires, and so he, he just tries a banzai move, and it, it's it's not it, it's ill judged. It's yeah, he could have. Uh, he could break that late and get around the corner, but <laughs> was, he, the other guy was always going to be in that gap by the time Yuki arrived. Um, yeah, that's just that's yeah, it was just uh, unfortunate. Yeah, while I favour not having penalties, I think that one was just a little bit too late from Sonoda, unfortunately. And it did damage Stroll's car as well because he retired while carrying damage. I think he was about 14th at the time, so he wasn't going anywhere. A shame for Sonoda because he's made some uh, good recent progress. Talking collisions, Scott, Alfa Romeo duo Kimi Raikkonen and Antonio Giovinazzi were 12th and 14th, sandwiching Williams driver George Russell. But we can add that pair's collision at turn one in the sprint race to the list of Alfa Romeo mishaps for this year. Whose fault was that? Uh, well, actually, I, I think this was. Uh, I, I think Raikkonen was a little bit, um, a little bit oblivious in just sort of turning in for the apex. Had the uh, uh, they had an Alpine in between them, didn't they? Uh, Giovinazzi was on the inside. Was it Fernando Alonso who was in, who was in between? Yeah, they just swooped either side of him. Yeah, exactly. And and Kimi just he obviously got in and and was paying attention to to, to the Alpine, but he. You know, Giovinazzi didn't come. Giovinazzi didn't do what Sonoda did to Stroll, did he? I think he was. Um, I think he was sort of entitled to be there. And ultimately, when 
if you make it free wide, you're asking for trouble. So I think um, if I remember correctly, that one was just sort of batted away as no further action necessary, um, which I think was about right because Giovinazzi is probably asking for a bit of trouble making it free wide on the inside. Raikkonen's asking for a bit of trouble just sort of turning into the corner when he knows that there's one, maybe even two cars there. So yeah, that's um, right outcome, silly incident. What was it you said about a lap before that happened in the sprint? I think I did say that the Alfa Romeo drivers were going to collide. Because it's just very Alfa Romeo and they're just finding all sorts of unique ways to compromise themselves these days. And now they've um, they've found a brand new one because I don't think they've hit each other before, have they? Not in that sort of circumstance. Uh, Raikkonen did hit the back of Giovinazzi in Portugal, I think it was, because he was trying to fiddle with a switch change at the end of the first lap, but that wasn't quite the same sort of situation. But yeah, I think Raikkonen probably couldn't see Giovinazzi, but should have been able to infer he was going to be there. And we talked about good Alpine team play with the two drivers. Probably Giovinazzi and Raikkonen could have both got through ahead of Alonso in that one. So not ideally executed, but yeah, I certainly wouldn't even think about penalising that one. Mark, Nicholas Latifi, we don't talk about him a huge amount, but he outqualified teammate Russell for the first time in 35 Grand Prix together. No, I'm not counting the Monza sprint race as qualifying. Then he finished ahead of him in the sprint race. Then he was 16th in the main Grand Prix, having dropped behind him with a questionably timed pit stop under the VSC. Latifi wasn't really very happy with the strategist. So what did you make of that call and the day when he finally almost beat Russell across all of the key parts of a race weekend? Yeah, they sort of threw the dice on Latifi's behalf, really, and um, I don't think he appreciated it. Uh, he, he was he was good this weekend. He was, he was at a good level. And... Um, yeah, I don't think there is the the final outcome really does him justice. Uh, I would say that's his most convincing weekend of um, his F1 career so far. Yeah, I'd agree with that. And Williams were struggling, but yeah, it didn't. Uh, uh, that didn't play a part in him in beating Russell Latifi. Just did a better job. Latifi's probably biggest strength is he does tend to hit the ground running in Friday practice straight away, and I don't think it's a coincidence that. In that previous sprint race weekend at Monza, he almost managed, also managed to get ahead of uh, of Russell uh, on the sprint. So, yeah, a nice promising sign for Latifi, but I don't think Russell will be losing too much sleep over it. And Scott, we'll come back to you as our collision correspondent. Uh, the Haas drivers, they were in their customary position at the back, both two laps down, but with Mazepin ahead, having passed Schumacher at the start. Schumacher then lost his front wing, or most of it anyway. Actually, he still had it under the front of the car, didn't he? But anyway, clash with uh, Kimi Raikkonen. So were you unimpressed the collision happened or impressed the Haas driver could get close enough to an Alfa Romeo to hit it? Both of the Haas drivers were giving it a red hot go in the midfield, weren't they? I I, I thought Schumacher's collision was very unlucky because um, Raikkonen attacked him on, on, on the outside and he did leave just about enough room on the inside. Schumacher was obviously fighting to get the car slowed down um, and actually did a, did a good job of doing that, made the apex of the corner and then he just had the tiniest of wobbles basically that he then had to correct which then sort of sent him back towards the the, the Alpha and then he sort of slapped into the left rear of uh, Raikkonen's car. And that's just a that's just a tiny error in, in, in battle, isn't it? It's it's not um piling into a corner and being out of control. It's a slight loss of control mid corner when you've actually done a very good job otherwise to keep everything as tidy as possible. So yeah, I, I don't think you can hold that against Schumacher too much really. It's just the sort of thing that can happen in World to World Combat. Yeah, and the, the Hasses actually were relatively brisk uh, into Lagos. Had a genuine chance of being able to scrap a little bit with the Williams drivers, so not too bad. And we also had Nikita Mazepin on the brink of tears after uh, messing up in qualifying. So, uh, yeah, interesting activities down at the back of the field. Mark, this was the third and final of F1's pilot sprint events. I think we know we're going to have more of them next year, but we don't know the, the precise format. They'll be a bit different. But James Donald from the Race Members Club asks, how do we feel about the impact the sprint has had on the weekend? He points out that by the end of the sprint, Hamilton was 20 seconds off the lead, but that, of course, was negated by the second start. So we had 24 extra laps and the second start. So is it good to give drivers that had a bad qualifying an extra chance or does it let them off the hook? Um, yeah, it, it depends what the circumstances are of the driver being thrown to the back of the grid, I guess, but, um, or, or whether he's you know, back of the grid through his own fault or in, ended up and there th- through something else. Um, I, I don't have a view on it particularly. It, it's, it's just the way the format plays out. Uh, I, I liked, I like the sprint format. Um, it, it certainly makes Saturday much more interesting. And um, I think it adds to Friday as well. 
So overall, uh, yeah, I, th I think it works. So, yeah, I think if if I could tweak it, I would make it, and, and I think this has been considered, I would make it so that Friday qualifying was for the Sunday grid and that the spring grid would be the championship order. But and and I would I wouldn't call the sprint as uh, qualifying anymore, and so but yeah I think um, overall it's it's got more more pros than cons. Mark, what do you think of Lando Norris's idea to have um, qualifying set the grid for Sunday's Grand Prix and then one uh, one shot qualifying on Saturday morning to set the grid for the sprint? Uh yeah, it would work us I, I suppose. Um, Somebody else had the idea of um, why don't you have the sprint um, for F two cars? So the F one the F one grid in in F two cars. I like that idea even more. <laughs> or we could put them all in pro cars. Go back to the early eighties. Yes. Be... <laughs> now we're talking. <laughs> Let's get the poor super cup and turn it into a kind no. of a, a mix. No, <laughs> no, move on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, probably going a little bit too far there, but I. I basically agree with you i like the fact that the sprint makes all three days relevant need to be some format changes but i'm i'm fine with that i think it's a it's a decent way certainly for some of the race weekends let's also point out that we've had uh three lewis hamilton max verstappen controversies across all three sprint weekends which is ultimately just a massive coincidence but it's just quite funny that that's been one of the quirks of the sprints this year there's always been there's always been something between these two drivers and it does create more opportunity for stuff to happen. As James Donald said in his question, if it wasn't a sprint weekend, would Hamilton have won from the back of the grid in the Grand Prix? I don't think he would have been able to. I think he needed the sprint to pick off uh, pick off that, that ground. I still think he'd have got a good result, but it created these interesting scenarios. So, uh, yeah, I, I don't have, a, have a, a problem with that. Uh, Mark, to finish off, it's part three of our triple continent, triple header in Qatar this weekend. It's the first time F1 has raced at the LaSalle circuit. So what should we expect there? It's an it's an interesting one because um, it's it it sort of keeps turning and keeps turning in on itself, but they look, it looks quite quick. So, yeah, does that does that favour one car or the other? Um, I, I I don't think so. I, I, it looks it looks as though there's not there's not a distinguishing feature which makes it say yeah that's definitely a Mercedes track or that's definitely a Red Bull track or whatever. Um, I think. Coming now, now that the the new power unit and Lewis's car has done one race, I don't think it'll have that uh, horsepower advantage that it's had this weekend. So, um, I don't, I, yeah, I, you know, it's 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 a it's a bit of a mugs game trying to guess this season between between things because there's always so many um, randomizing factors, and it's usually to do with the, how the tires behave and how that dovetails in with the, the track temperature of the surface or whatever um but yeah on just on a, a casual glance at the, the 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 layout of the track i don't think um i don't think it should favor one or the other there is obviously something pretty seismic happening in in qatar this weekend do either of you two know what it is no i have absolutely no idea what's the story it's uh the three of us are going to be working together on site at a grand prix for the first time does that does that well not not technically the first time because no 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 I don't count no I don't count because the last time we did this we started a, we started an entire pandemic so I don't think we ever actually had chance to work together yeah certainly in the uh, the race era we have all been on the ground at a Grand Prix in, of course, in the yeah. past prior to the start of last year but yeah that's 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 obviously what everybody's talking about that's the that's exactly the big story. it was it was the paddock was a buzz with the uh, with, with, with the concept which means I mean does that present the possibility of our first uh, group all together in the same place podcast of what's it we must have done one in testing last in 2020 i'm not sure that, i'm not actually sure yeah. whether we've ever been all <laughs> but, so, in the same so you got excited somewhere. at the start of this podcast at the proximity of the two of us on the sofa we could have this time next week we could have mark in between us on on, on the sofa <laughs> that sounds perfect it's been a funny old couple of years for everyone hasn't it so uh yeah it's taken us a while to uh, have a, a single location podcast but that's something to look forward to i know that'll be the big talking point of the weekend we'll be firing questions at drivers in the thursday press conference about that well thanks to scott mitchell and mark hughes for your insight there's 
loads more where that came from on therace.com and don't forget the hyphen including Mark's race analysis my driver ratings and Scott's look at the finely poised title battle make sure you check out our other podcasts including Bring Back V10s and also our YouTube channel where you can find the winners and losers from the Brazilian Grand Prix we're all off to Doha now so we'll be back soon with everything you need to know from the Qatar Grand Prix (laughs) 